Good morning, everybody. First, let me apologize that it's been a couple of weeks since I've posted a lesson. Um, the lesson I'm going to uh, record today is actually the one that I did after mission trip and mission trip week was so crazy. I had no time to record it during mission week. And then um, I left to go to my son's wedding. So i um, been a little busy, uh, but I did want to post this particular lesson because it's about John Wesley. And John Wesley is the person who started the Methodist Church. He has a very interesting background. Um, and I think it's important if you are going to join the church um, when you are confirmed, you will become members of the United Methodist Church. It's important for you guys to understand where the, the origins of this particular denomination started. So let me say a quick prayer and then we'll get into the lesson. Father God, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for um, the summertime. Thank you for those who are on vacation and enjoying time with family and friends, maybe going to places they haven't been before. It's so nice to feel like we can go out and do things more safely um, now that COVID is not quite such a threat. And Father, thank you for those who are in town and are still coming to class. It's so important to keep that um, community um, feel in confirmation, um, even though we have lower numbers, Father, I'm just grateful for those who are in town and, and come up, come into class on Sunday morning. So Lord, I just give this time to you. Please bless my words as I talk about John Wesley. He wasn't a perfect man, but he definitely was a man after your heart and um, the repercussions of what he did and how he lived his, his life have had um, just enormous impact on on the world and especially on this community because of saint andrew so just bless my words as i speak i ask these things in jesus name amen all right um not a whole lot of announcements um a camp impact registration is open so if you guys want to go camp is going to be out of control awesome this year especially since we missed last year so um please sign up to go parents um we do need a lot of parent volunteers um, especially parents that are willing to stay for the entire camp Monday through Sunday morning. Uh, yeah, Sunday morning. So if you if that's something that interests you or something you would be willing to do, please go ahead and sign up yourselves for camp. Um, there is a little bit of a discount for adults. Um, and if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. All right. So let me share my screen so we can talk about John Wesley. All right. There we go. All right, so John Wesley is uh, is considered to be the founder of the Methodist Church. There is a picture of, of good old John. You can tell by his hair and by his clothes that he um, lived in the 1700s. Um, that's actually probably a wig he has on because that was the fashion at the time. Um, but John Wesley was born in 1703 in England. His dad was a Anglican priest or a rector. Um, and so he grew up um, in the church and having the church um, be a, a big part of his life. He was one of 19, yes, 19 children. Um, his mom was very busy. Um, he was, um, there were many more girls than boys. He was the 15th of the 19 children. Um, so um, I'm grateful we don't have families that are that big these days, but um, he had a lot of brothers and sisters. When he was five years old, he survived a house fire. Um, there is a, a painting of it. You can see the rectory there in the background. They lived in what would have been the parsonage, um, the, the housing that was provided for pastors at the time. And it was a huge fire. It burnt the house down to the ground. And John Wesley was one of the last um, people to be rescued. He was on the top floor, as you can see. When he was rescued, his mother said he was like a brand plucked from the fire, meaning like a brand that you would brand a, a cattle with or something that it he you know was hot and he was but he was pulled out before um, obviously harm came to him. She also believed that this was a sign that God had destined great things for him. So he um, she really felt him to be a favored child uh, because he survived this particular fire. Um, when he was 11, he was sent off to boarding school, which at the time was not very unusual. Um, he was bullied while he was there. I get the feeling that maybe John Wesley was a little 
nerdy and a little, you know, very much a rule follower, very disciplined in what he did. That doesn't always rub kids um, of the similar age in a good way. So he was made fun of a lot and he was bullied, but he hung in there. And eventually when he was 17, he went off to Oxford to study theology. He was following in his father's footsteps. When he was at Oxford, oh, look, there my face is in the way again. Let me move that out. There we go. While he was at Oxford, he and his brother Charles, who in and of himself was a pretty remarkable guy, Charles actually wrote a lot of hymns. There are many, many um, Methodist hymns that um, are attributed to Charles Wesley. Um, Hark the Herald Angels Sing is one of his more famous ones. But um, John Wesley gets a lot of the spotlight, but his brother Charles was actually a very accomplished uh, man as well. But he and his brother Charles, when they were at Oxford, they started meeting with a group of students um, for a Bible study. And they wanted, they worked to be incredibly disciplined in how they studied the Bible and what they did. All of their actions and movements were very intentional. Um, they felt like if they they committed themselves to Bible study and prayer and worship and service to the poor, that that would make them great men of God. And again, it was this idea that he was very, very disciplined in doing everything that he did. Um, and the group of students that started meeting with him adopted those ideas. Well, as you can imagine in college, um, that didn't go along well with a lot of the other students that were there who may not have had the same um, desire to be as pious or as disciplined as John and Charles and his group. So they actually got made fun of a lot, even when they were at Oxford. Um, they were, um, the group that they formed was given nicknames by other students and none of them were very complimentary. They were um, called enthusiasts, which at the time was a derogatory term, like they were sort of nutty and crazy because they were so committed to what they were trying to do, um, their habits. They were called Bible bigots, which as you can imagine is not a very nice term. And they were called the holy club, sort of in a sarcastic term that they were holy and nobody else was. But they really stuck with it. They were committed to this idea that if they studied scripture, if they were, if they prayed on a regular basis, if they did went to worship on a regular basis and they served the poor, that this would make them um, their uh, God would be pleased with them and God would bless them in doing those things. Um, eventually, because of this discipline that they had, they got coined the term the Methodists from method. They had a method to what they were doing. And that's exactly where the word Methodist comes from, is that it was this method that they had that they stuck to. Um, uh, from what I have read, John Wesley did not really care for that term. He didn't really think it captured what they were trying to do, but it was a term that stuck and obviously you know, 300 years later, we're still referred to as Methodists. So after he um, graduated from college and had been a preacher for a little while, he was asked with Charles, his brother, to go to the colony of Georgia in America. So this was 1732, long before the revolution. They weren't states yet, but they were being founded by um, pioneers and settlers who were going over there looking for, you know, religious freedom or freedom from whatever it is they felt was keeping them down. And um, James Oglethorpe, who was the head of the colony in Georgia, invited John and Charles to come over. And John was incredibly excited about this. He had this vision of going to Georgia and preaching to not only the English settlers that had gone over there, but also to the Native Americans who he had heard about. His, um, he had great enthusiasm. He had this, these great ideas of how he was gonna convert everybody. And they would all start following the Methodist ideas at this time, it wasn't a denomination itself. It was just what he felt was the right thing to do to become closer to God. And he thought everybody should do it. And um, so he went there with great high expectations and enthusiasms. Unfortunately, it was a huge failure. <laughs> uh, while he was there in his journal, he wrote something to the effect of, I went to America to convert the Indians, but oh, who shall convert me? Even in all of this methodology, all, even in all of this discipline, John Wesley still didn't feel 
truly connected to God, didn't really feel that God loved him, that he was worthy of God's love, even though he was trying to go through all of these motions. And so even while he was there trying to spread the gospel, which is one of the things that Jesus tells us to do, um, he was still not totally comfortable with his own faith. Um, it turned out that in Georgia, it was a complete failure. I think Charles left after just a few months. Um, John stuck it out for a little bit while longer, but clearly when he was getting no converts and the church he was starting had very few members, he finally decided he was going to pack it in and head back to England. So this is a, a depiction of him trying to convert the Native Americans, as you can see there. Um, he did his best, but they really didn't have any interest in what he was offering. So this is a picture of him on his voyage back to England. While he was on his ship going from uh, Georgia back to England, which would have taken a few weeks across the Atlantic Ocean, they came across this great storm. As you can see up in that upper uh, left-hand part, you can kind of see water streaming in. Um, they were in the middle of a storm. The boat was being tossed around and John Wesley was convinced it was going to sink and they all were going to die. And he went below deck, very fearful and nervous, and he saw a group of Morovians. This was a German um, sect that um, he had heard about when um, he was in England. Um, and this was a group of Morovians and they were calmly sitting there in prayer disaster was falling all around them and they were just calm they were praying they were peaceful they were at very much acceptance as to whatever was going to happen and this just impacted john in a way that he had not anticipated clearly they survived the storm the boat didn't sink it made it safely back to london and when he got back there he started visiting morovian churches because he was so intrigued at um the behavior of the Moravians, just how peaceful they were in the midst of this sort of catastrophe, that they really had trust that God was going to take care of them one way or the other, God was going to take care of them and eat whatever happened was going to be okay with them. And this, that was the kind of faith that John Wesley had been looking for. Um, this is actually a picture that I took when I visited London a few years ago, when John Wesley went back to um, visit a Moravian church in London, and it was a place called Aldersgate. Um, and he went and was listening to um, the commentary that Martin Luther had written about the book of Romans. And as uh, he was listening to this commentary be read, he said he felt his heart strangely warmed. And what he wrote in his journal was, while he was describing the man who was reading um, the commentary on Romans. Um, he said, while he was describing the change, which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation. And an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. And so that was the moment where John Wesley's faith totally changed. He realized that salvation is a gift. It's something that we accept. It's not something that we can work for. He moved, um, you might hear people say, moved from an idea of legalism to an idea of grace. Um, after we are all back in August, I will do two weeks on grace because for John Wesley, the idea of grace was the key to our relationship with God and with Jesus. Um, and, and it was at this moment that he really understood what that meant. And so as Methodists, a lot of times you might hear people refer to, you know, my heart was strangely warm. That's a very well-known term because it comes out of John Wesley's um, journal when he really, really understood how much God loved him and that salvation was a gift that just needs to be accepted. So this is a um, I guess sculpture, I guess, that is very close to um, Aldersgate that you that is outside of the Museum of London in London. And it's actually a replication of his journal um, and when he talks about his heart being strangely warmed. So in response to that, he really changed how he um, preached after that. He still felt very, very committed to um, 
scripture and to prayer and to worship and servicing the poor. They were very big about going out and and helping um, widows and orphans and people in jail, the poor. Um, all of that was still a part of what they did. But John Wells Wesley felt compelled to go out and preach to those who may not hear or be welcomed in a normal Church of England. Back in those days, um, the Anglican Church was very structured. Um, churches were pretty much for the wealthy. If you were um, not very wealthy, you had to sit in the back of the church. You were not really welcomed. Um, it was sort of like the riffraff showing up um, on Sunday mornings. And so a lot of the lower class citizens or the working class citizens just decided not to go to church because they didn't feel welcome there. They didn't feel like it was a place they could call home or a place where they felt welcomed. And John Wesley recognized this and decided if they're not going to come to the church, I am going to go to them. He had a very good friend of his who was an itinerant preacher. That means a preacher who doesn't really have his own church, but he just goes around preaching wherever God leads him. And John Wesley took up this habit. Um, they, uh, he would just go from place to place and he didn't have to be in a church when he preached, he would preach in a field, he would church like as depicted in this picture in the center of the town and anybody who wanted to come listen to him could, they would stop. They were intrigued by him. So he really brought the gospel to the people where they were very much in the way of Jesus, right? We, we hear all about the stories about Jesus who went to the people themselves, the people who needed him, he went to them and John Wesley really took that um, idea and applied it in his own um, community where he would go around. He was considered an itinerant preacher, meaning that he would go from town to town. He rode his horse um, all over and the, the other preachers who were following John Wesley did the same thing. So the Wesley's one expectation was that a changed heart was evidenced by a changed habit in life. And I think that's one of the things that he realized when his heart was strangely warm. He felt totally changed and how he preached and how his, what his relationship with God was changed forever after that. And that's the only thing that he he thought was a clear indication of someone who had really accepted Jesus's gift of grace was when their life changed. If they kept behaving the way they did beforehand, there was some doubt, um, but a heart evidenced, um, an, the, a changed heart was evidenced by a changed habits in life, starting to do the things you're supposed to do, reading your Bible, praying, helping the poor, and all of those things. So this is a picture of him kind of riding on his horse. Um, apparently he had a talent of being able to read while he rode his heart horse, which I don't really understand how that works, but I don't spend a lot of time on a horse either. So um, some estimations say that Wesley rode over 250,000 miles throughout England and Wales, preaching the gospel to people who didn't necessarily feel welcomed in churches. Um, I think someone once told me that's like three times around the circumference of the earth. So um, Lord, no, he, he had saddle sores as he did that, but that was his calling. He wanted to meet the people where he was. He wanted to make the gospel available to him. And um, that was his, that's what he felt was needed to be done to reach people. So there is another picture of um, John Wesley. So what happens is while he is in England and now he, get, he is getting older, he doesn't say to himself, all right, well, I have a good thing going here. So I'm just going to start this denomination. The actual denomination of Methodism didn't start until after John Wesley died. He just sort of was doing what he felt like he was told to do, what God wanted him to do. Um, other people caught on and joined him and did the same thing. And it really wasn't until um, later in his life and he realized that the colonies after they had become the United States were um, in, in need of people with Methodist ideas um, and that there were, the, the Anglican church was over there just perpetuating that same idea of this hierarchy of, of you know, only the rich people can go to church and the lower working class were not getting to hear the gospel. And so he asked the Anglican church if he could send some laymen over 
to start preaching to the working class. And the Anglican church said, no, you can't. And so in a spirit of rebellion, really, John Wesley ordained these laymen to go and start preaching. And when the Anglican church heard that he did that, they kicked him out of the church, which really by all accounts was really not a problem for him because he wasn't really on board with everything that they were doing. But um, in the late 1700s, um, uh, these group of laymen um, went over to the United States and, and that's when, um, whoops, wrong one. That's really when the Methodist church started in the United States. So this week, I'm actually talking about the history of the early church, really how do we get from Jesus to St. Andrew, and I'll include some of that Methodist history in there. So I'll talk a little bit more about that on Sunday morning. But um, I, what I wanted you guys to understand is that he didn't say, I have this great idea of a denomination and this, and I'm going to start it. And this is what it's going to look like. He just did what God asked him to do. And it wasn't until after his death that the Methodist movement really became a defined thing and became its own denomination. And for the most part, that happened after it came to the United States. There are Methodists in England, um, but the real start of the Methodist church happened um, in America. So there you go. There is John Wesley in a nutshell. He was not perfect. Um, he uh, grew in his faith his entire life. Um, he was willing to change when God asked him to. Um, he had a lot of failures. He had a lot of things that didn't work out well for him, but he kept going. Um, and obviously, um, because we attend a church called St. Andrew United Methodist Church, he had an impact on a lot of people, um, including us. So there is John Wesley. Um, like I said, this Sunday, I'm going to be talking about the history of the church from Jesus to St. Andrew. So I'll include a little bit more uh, Methodist history in that. Um, I'm kind of a history person, so I think it's really interesting. Um, but anyway, so there you go. Um, I will um, please, if you are not in town um, in the next few weeks, please um, pay attention because I am going to be posting um, the lessons online so you guys can catch up on them if you want to. And um, if you're not in town, I hope whatever you're doing is super, super fun. So love you guys. Um, hope to see you soon in class. And, um, you know, God bless and be safe. Love you guys.